Hello and welcome to my studio. I'm Jessie and this is the Knit Up and Die podcast, episode 59, Breathe In, Breathe Out. As always, I'm going to start with a very special thank you to all of my new and ongoing subscribers. I love you guys. And what you see here is really all about you. If there is something that you're looking for, a demonstration or discussion, just reach out to me. I'm happy to add you and your wishes to my podcast. I'd like to start, of course, by thanking my newest subscribers. A special hello and welcome to S.P. Bardwell, Alyssa, and Misty. You guys are wonderful. Thank you for adding me to your lives. Also, special love and thanks go out to, and I have a big list this time, guys, Tiffany, Kath, Jen, Lamore, Vachon, Marie, Linda, Bex, Wheezy, Cindy, Christy, Neetzi, Charlotte, Chris, Roseanne, Linda, Marie, Leanne, Eve, Linda, David, Donna, Betty Ann, Scott and John, Carolyn, Kate, Terry, Nancy, Rachel, Carol, thank you for weighing in on the super wash discussion. You gave me a lot to think about and I did a lot of research because you thank you for that. Tina, Carmen, Roseanne, Carice, Susan, Cynthia, and Gertrude. Thank you guys. Um, special warm hello and thank you go out of course to my patrons. If you don't know about my patronage page, uh, please have a visit and consider offering your support. There are benefits at every level. The chances are very high in the drawing levels that you'll be a winner. Um, in some cases it's a 50-50 chance, in some cases you're one in three, one in four. Give it a shot, who knows, and as little as a dollar gets you in. Um, next drawing is March 3rd. That's the next podcast. It's right around the corner, so be sure to sign up today to be able to do that with us. Um, I'm going to start with a sneak peek. Um, I had a couple people come forward and said, you know, look, I love the idea of the patronage, but I'm not comfortable not knowing what yarn I'm going to get at that level. And I understand that <laughs> because sometimes you, you're your taste is very specific and the surprise colorway might be more than a surprise. Um, so if you are at the, I believe it's subscriber level, if you're one of the $30 patrons and you're going to receive the um, custom colorway of the month and you'd like it to be a surprise, look away now. <laughs> And if you're considering coming in at that level and you'd like to see what that custom colorway is this month, now's your chance. It is still wet, so the colors are a little bit more vibrant than what you will see when you receive it, but I wanted to give you that sneak peek. This is the March level at the $30 subscription level. It's basically the same as being part of a sock club. That's the yarn. I'm very excited about this. There are some speckles in there. You're going to see a little bit, but beautiful, beautiful colors. And I'm not going to describe it for those of you that are looking away that want the surprise. It is still wet. It is still tied up. So it's still a little bit more vibrant than what you will get. Um, but they're just going to blend to be even more beautiful. That's put away. <laughs> if you were looking away, you may look back. We're here. Okay. Um, so. Moving on, update on my 1,000 things. If you're following along, you know that I'm trying to rid my life of 1,000 things in my house. I haven't had a lot of opportunity to work on that this past week. Um, I have been doing my physical therapy for my shoulder and part of that is I'm not supposed to be doing any work up over my head, which basically means I'm not doing tops of closets, which I really probably ought to get to. Um, but I bought a step ladder, so I don't have to work over my head, and I have a husband who can work over his head. Um, I am up to 755 things, and the garage is coming. My husband is on board. He's starting to look at the garage. It's really about having warmer weather so we can empty everything out into the driveway. Um, oh, and <laughs> those of you who uh, follow along, you know that I had a trunk organizer that I loved, and... I had it in my trunk when I took a whole bunch of those things down to donate and unfortunately my trunk organizer was donated as well. I did order new ones online. They arrived 
sort of. <laughs> it was hysterical. I, I got home and I had the the little postcard from the post office that said I needed to go to the post office to pick up my package and sign for it because it, it came in from Ireland for me. And I got down there and I filled out all the paperwork, my name and you know, print and sign and fill in your address and show me your ID. Yes, I really did order something. And the representative went out back and she came back with my package. It appeared to have been a cardboard box at one time. It may have actually closed at one time. This box was destroyed, destroyed. And she's like, there wasn't anything fragile in it, was there? It's hard plastic and hard plastic, if you hit it right, can shatter or it can bend or it can weaken. Fortunately, although the box didn't make it, my my trunk organizers did, and I'm very excited about those. No, I don't have them here to show you. Um, if you are interested, certainly message me, and I can send you the information where I get them. They're really wonderful. They are uh, a hard plastic, L-shaped kind of thing with Velcro on the bottom, so it sticks to the floor of your trunk, and they hold all of your boxes and bags of stuff upright. So. I, I found it amusing that the box was so bad. In fact, when I left the post office, they took the box for me <laughs> uh, after I had inspected the contents and I left with just the contents. Um, moving on to knitting. Ha 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 ha. I have not knit a single stitch since our last podcast. Not one. Um, as you're, I'm sure, very well aware, I'm in timeout for a shoulder injury. I have a torn rotator cuff. I am doing physical therapy for that. Um, unfortunately, my bicep is very inflamed because my bicep has been doing all the work that my shoulder was supposed to be doing for God knows how long. I don't even know really when the tear happened. I, I can guess. I suspect it's been a couple years, um, which is why I'm struggling to, to heal and why this is building up and becoming a problem. Um, I'm doing my physical therapy. Unfortunately, the pain is not going away. And I have talked to my physical therapist a couple times about that. And this past week in discussion, she was like, mm, you know, you, you should be, your range of motion's improving, but your pain should be improving as well. And I say, it's just not happening. I, I've got all this pain here. And she's, I said, I don't, I don't think that's my bicep. This seems wrong. Is, is there another injury? Have I done something wrong? Am I doing my exercises wrong? We went through the whole thing. I showed her what I was doing and she's like, your exercises are right. And you're right. That's not your bicep. So, uh, she ran me through a couple of, um, Nerve glides, I think she called them. Basically, it's a it's an exercise where you posture your body in certain ways, and in doing this, it'll trigger a bundle of nerves and tell you what's going on. And so I, I did these elaborate ballet moves, and we figured it out. And she's pretty sure I have um, thoracic outlet syndrome on top of this, and this is why this has become a bigger problem versus just healing the shoulder. Thoracic outlet syndrome, as I understand it, is very similar to having carpal tunnel, except instead of having it here, here, it's here, here. What's happening is a bundle of nerves and veins and everything goes through from your thoracic into your arm underneath your um, clavicle. Clavicle's here, comes across, this bundle of nerves comes down and goes through down into your arm here. This is where I'm experiencing pain. That nerve bundle is pinching, or the blood flow there is pinching, or the tendons there are pinching, any one of the three is possible. That's why I'm experiencing this pain. Well, what causes that? Number one, the injury and the swelling and everything that was going on. Number two, heavy handbags always carrying a backpack on one side, um, any number of things, but anything that puts pressure on the clavicle can pinch that down. Um, yeah, very narrow bra straps can cause this, a number of things can cause this. Um, it, I have a compound issue, basically, is what's going on. With this particular issue, there's not really a quick fix. Yay! 
Um, it's more about lifestyle changes and I have made a number of lifestyle changes already as trying to take care of my shoulder. One of which is I can't sleep on my side, either side, um, unless I have like a pillow against me to prop my arm up against. I need to learn to sleep on my back. If any of you have ever tried to change your sleeping habits, you know what I'm going through. I'm not getting a lot of sleep. Um, resting my arm up before I go to bed at night to open that up to get blood flow flowing down. Um, not carrying heavy bags, lightening your load, making sure that if you have a backpack it's on both sides. And again, a number of physical therapy moves. I, I now have quite the repertoire. <laughs> spend a lot of time moving around. Um, so this is, it, it's a compound problem and it's something that I'm aggressively working on, but it also means that I need to take a break from knitting. Um, and I need to really work on my posture, which is a great reminder right here, right now, work on my, work on my posture, as we all should. We all should. We have a tendency to hunch, especially when we're doing close crafts. This hunching is part of what's causing this. I'm cutting it off naturally by hunching over. So, ladies, everybody sit up. Men, sit up, stretch. Make sure you are upright and square. Pretend you're ballroom dancing while you knit, if that's what helps. Um, breathe in. Breathe out. But breathe out forward, not down. I'm learning. I'm learning. Um, so, what have I been designing? Nothing, because I can't swatch. <laughs> um, bow truckle is basically done testing. You guys were wonderful, thank you. Your pictures were beautiful, your feedback was wonderful. If I haven't gotten back to you, it's not because I'm ignoring you. I simply haven't gotten to it. Um, I anticipate to finish final edits, get back to everybody this week, and hopefully release by next weekend. Yay, new pattern. Um, Madly Addicted to You is out to test knitters. Thank you guys. And uh, we'll see what comes of that. So far, so good. I haven't heard anything um, that needs an edit yet, which is astounding. If you're interested in popping in on that one, I'd love to have you along. I do still have room for it, and I could really use a couple extra testers. Um, even if you just want to do a swatch sample for me, just to make sure that I'm, I'm on board, uh, that if you'd like to help out, I, I appreciate your knitting hands. Um, what have I been dying? Well, I just, I showed you the new custom colorway for the March drawing. That's one of the few things I've been dying. I did have a really big sale last weekend in my shop. And that wiped me out in a lot of things, so I, I am slowly dying to get back into that. I was planning on doing a demo today, and I am sorry I did not do the prep I was supposed to. I spent yesterday on the sofa licking my wounds, <laughs> as it were, just taking some time off and doing other things um, to relax and to not be lifting and boiling water and all the things that aggravate my shoulder. So in not doing those things, I forgot to do my prep for my demo today. Um, however, let's pop into the kitchen briefly and let's talk about how I document. So here we are in the kitchen and I don't have any great demonstration for you today. I had intended to do a demo, but I didn't prepare. I really spent a lot of time on my sofa just rubbing lotion into my shoulder and pretending I wasn't in pain when in fact I was. But one of the things that I get asked a lot about is how I document my dyeing. That's a good question. If you want to replicate your, your yarns, your dyes, you need to document it. So I always have notebooks at the ready. And you'll see I have lots of notebooks at the ready. Often these are my scribbles in a book that have my general documentation in it. Once I've found a colorway that I like, I transfer it to a more permanent book and I write very carefully and very neatly in that. But again, that's after I've taken everything away from this messy environment. These are rough. And that's because there's a lot of liquid, there's a lot of dye, I'm wet when I'm writing them, things smear. I'm lucky if I can see exactly what I did.
but the documentation is important. So what I do, and I'll give you a quick demo on a fresh sheet, is I document the type of pan I'm using, how the yarn is laid out in that pan, how much water I've added to it, how much vinegar I've added to it. Then I put in my actual dye recipe. And again, I'm documenting how much water I used, <laughs> how much dye I've added, what combination of dyes I've added to it in these increments so that I know exactly how to replicate that colorway. Yes, I do document time and I document the setting that my stove is at so that I know roughly what temperature. But again, this is pretty loose. I'm not pulling out a thermometer and calculating the temperature. And if things are, you know, it's powder, it's in small spoons. Things may differ a little bit from one spoon measure to another. That's just the nature of the beast. We are not professional dyers in big manufacturing things that have giant vats of dye. We're home dyers in small batches, and that is an art, and it is unique every time. That's mainly because it's really hard to replicate exactly, but also because who wants to? It's art, it's fun, and we should enjoy the variances from skein to skein. I'm going to grab the camera, I'm going to bring it around, and I'm going to show you exactly how I document a recipe. All of my formulas are based on two to three skeins. When I reproduce a colorway, I reproduce in that increment. That's the amount that fits in my pot, that's the amount of dye I designed for, and therefore I have a set formula. I don't often scale recipes because you're talking about adding more to a pot and hoping everything flows around in the same way and gets contact on all the same yarns at the same time. It's easier to do two pots of the same recipe than one giant pot of a double recipe. The first thing I document is how many skeins I'm using and what base I'm putting it on. Next thing I do is I document my pan layout. In this particular recipe I'm going to document out one of my roasting pans and I draw in my skeins. This is a simple easy sketch. There's no big detail here but it's showing me how I laid the skeins out in my roasting pan. Then I denote how much water I added to the pan and what I did. In this particular case I know that I added six cups of water plus one cup of vinegar and I always preheat for four minutes on high. That's all well and fine, that's my base, and I know that I soak it. I don't have to write down that I soak, I know that I soak it. You may initially want to write down all of those details until you have certain habits in place. The next thing I do is I draw on my diagram how I add the dyes and what I've added. So I may add one cup of water plus one dash of say an emerald. And I know that I do an end pour on that end. On this side I may do one cup of water plus one dash of let's say a navy. And I do an end pour on that end. I often will draw additional information on the side. In this particular case I'm indicating that I did an end pour of each color and then I tilted the pan back and forth to bleed those colors toward the middle. This will cause a blend in the center. But of course that's very pretty but just not enough. <laughs> I always like to do something extra, something that is harder for other people to replicate or adds a little something extra to the overall effect. In this particular case I went back and I did a scribble all over in the middle. So I know I used a half a cup 
plus one dash. Sorry, I'm cheating and looking off to the side to figure out what I put in so that I can replicate this for you. Of a purple, and I scribbled, and I'll just make a mark to indicate that I scribbled. That's it. That's how I've documented this. When I'm all said and done with it, if I've had to flip it and repeat, I would note that. Set at 225 degrees in oven for 20 minutes. Flip to expose white side and repeat. When it's all done, if I love the end product, the last thing I need to do is name it. Now I know when I go back to replicate this recipe, I have everything I need to need in order to do so. It's not the neatest, it's not the most detailed, but it's enough to remind me of what process I used. Generally, you'll have certain sets of processes that you repeat on a regular basis. For example, if it's a circular wall pour or a half wall pour, I denote that a little bit differently. For this particular recipe, I've denoted that I'm doing half wall pours in a circular pan. Oh, I did not put down what my base was. I was so busy writing the recipe, I didn't put down the details. I know that I soaked the yarn in four inches of water plus a third of a cup of vinegar that I used two skeins of my tap base, that I did a half wall pour, and that I took the leftovers that were in each of the jars after I poured them out, and I blended them again with a little bit of water, and I did them in a center pour just to cause a point where there was a merging of the colors. That's that. I don't need to know how I set it just because I've done it so many times I know what my set process is, but if it's new to you, you might want to put in that instruction as well. That's what it works for me. What works for you is what you're going to document. I strongly suggest having a notebook. I strongly suggest being open to it, being a dribbled, smeared mess. And then if you like the yarn, transfer the recipe to a more permanent book. That's how I document my recipes. We're back. We're back in the studio. Thank you. Um, there, there's some up and coming uh, kinds of changes, sort of, that are, are coming in so far as the business goes. I talked to you guys last week that I was looking at different bases and I was thinking about bringing in some super wash. Um, I'm researching that a little bit more. I, I heard that, uh, in fact, um, Carol was wonderful. Carol came forward and let me know that at Vogue Knitting Live, there was some discussion by designers against using super wash. This is something that comes around from time to time um, for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's about suppliers who are trying to drive expenses down by not doing this extra chemical thing to yarn to make it super wash. Sometimes it's a fashion thing. Sometimes it's a sponsorship thing. Sometimes it's a um, earth awareness thing. It comes around, it goes around. What I'm finding is that there's a lot of contradiction. Some of the designers that are saying don't use superwash have in years past said do use superwash and they vacillate back and forth. 
So I don't have any good answers yet. Overall, what I'm hearing is that Superwash uh, will lose its shape. If you wash it in a washing machine, it's going to lose its shape whether it's Superwash or not. Um, so it, I, mm, I'm, I'm looking at it further. I'm looking at it further. More so than that is industry-wide, we're about to see an increase in wool costs. Wool is in fashion. Wool is in fashion. And unfortunately, as our demand goes up, our ability to produce more wool quickly does not, and that drives prices up. Just this morning, I got a notification from my supplier that rates are going to go up, and um, I, I'm looking at that cost. I'm looking at how that's going to impact me. If I can absorb that cost and keep my rates the same, that's all in consideration. And if you're somebody who is just getting into dyeing yarn, it's going to be a consideration for you as well as to the cost of our raw supply. Um, yay! Wool is in fashion. We like that. We like that. Do we like paying higher prices? No, but, but it's in fashion and that is a good thing. That means that our industry is about to come into another big expansion and all of you who are dyeing yarn, all of you who are designing patterns, all of you who are networking and learning to knit and adding to your skill set, yay, our community is going to expand. We love this. Um, I, I'm researching. I'm researching. I have on order coming in um, a book. Yay! I ordered a book. It's an expensive book. Uh, I, I actually really hemmed and hawed about bringing it in because A, I need it, B, it's expensive, and C, I, I hate spending lots of money on things. Um, but I need it, so, so I did it. The book is Knitting Comfortably. It's the ergonomics of hand knitting. I know very little about it other than it talks about posture and ways to make more economy of your movements and make your knitting more comfortable and more you, you, your ability to endure more uh, and to be healthier in doing it. Once that book is in, I will be talking about that for you guys and discussing what I'm learning from it. So there'll be a review in the future. Um, I also ordered yarn with that book. I need more yarn desperately, obviously, and I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it because I can't knit it right now, but it's beautiful and I can't wait for it to come in. Um, business talk. <laughs> so my, my opportunities here are limited. I, I don't get to show you any dyeing today, and I don't really get to show you any knitting today. But I know that a lot of you are watching me because you're, you're starting either a dye business or you're augmenting your dye business or you're um, just curious about the industry. So I'm trying to talk more about that and expose more about that. And of course, you know, I, just, I just talked to you about this huge consideration with the price of wool going up. So one of the things that's really, really important about your business as a dyer is keeping an eye on your expenses. And it's really easy for expenses to get out of control. Um, you know, we have, we have wool and we have dye and we have our acid. And those are our primary expenses. We have this secondary expense that happens and that may be the cost of water if you're not on a well and that may be electricity for sure if you're using your stove there's an electric bill and if you're small like me that's part of your household expense and it may not be a huge impact but then there's all the other expenses labeling shipping packaging marketing all those extra little things and they don't sound like a lot. You think, well, you know, I can market inexpensively. That's easy enough. Instagram and word of mouth and all that. But then there's shipping and labeling. And those can get big fast. So I wanted to give you a couple more resources. And I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Shipping, of course, you're going to want some kind of box or envelope to get your yarn out in. And there are sources that are very expensive and there are sources that are not as expensive but require that you buy in bulk. So you feel like you're taping, taking a leap of faith 
when you order 50 shipping envelopes, and I get that, but there's longevity to it. And it drives the price down in such a way that if you only use 25 of those envelopes and you decide to close your business, you will have paid about the same amount as if you had only bought 25 of those envelopes. Um, also, if you're using Etsy and you're shipping out of Etsy, you're printing shipping labels. Those shipping labels, if you're buying them at a large office supply store, are pricey, big time pricey. There are cheaper alternatives. Um, you have the option of either purchasing in bulk the clear sticky envelopes that attach to the front of your package and then you can print your label on plain paper and slide it in. That is an option. Or buying those in bulk from an actual supplier. You get the same product. It doesn't say Avery on it or Office Max or Staples on it, but it's the same product at a better price. Um, ink, of course, be mindful, you're going to be printing, and that ink can add up. I, I'm looking over at my printer going, Hur. um, and your inserts, your, your packing slips, be mindful that you have that printing cost and you're going to have to have paper. Purchasing on sale is a great thing, and having a little bit of extra because you bought two and got one free versus buying one, buying one, buying one. It's just smart thinking overall. Look at, look at the overall budget. Look at how the cost per item comes down when you buy more in bulk. Labeling. Um, if you've ever bought from me, you see that I use a business card. I do order my business cards in bulk. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the company. I will have it here for you. Generally, I order 250 to 500 at a time. That seems like a lot. Believe it, you're going to go through them whether you're handing them out or attaching them to your yarns. I also buy ribbon in bulk and I use my ribbons to tie. I punch holes in the business cards and I tie it on. I buy labels in bulk and I print the um, content and stick it on the back of my business card. That's what works for me. You may find that printing them on paper and then using a paper cutter and cutting off bands and wrapping and either taping or stapling, please tape, staples are awful to yarn, um, is a better answer for you. It's about you and your choices and your budget. But then there's hidden costs. <laughs> One of the hidden costs is ties. When you're dyeing your yarn, you need to tie that yarn in advance. And it may look inexpensive initially to use a cotton yarn. Buy a twine in bulk. And I'll, I'll have that up on the screen for you as well as to where I'm getting my supplies. Um, for the most part, you'll hear me talk about Dharma Trading Company for my dye. Um, I'm checking my cheat sheet here. I use you pack and ship for labels and for some of my bags, uh, the, the shipping bags, and I use papermart.com for my ribbon and other bags. Really these sources uh, don't necessarily have a minimum, it's not like you're, you're putting out $300 to get in base stuff, however a lot of the items come in larger quantities, $50, hundred. Um, it's really about looking at long-term and overall cost. I hope that's helpful. I hope these resources are good for you. I know that when I started, I, I did have a mentor that helped me and gave me a couple of sources, but over the years, I've reached out to people that I have purchased sock blanks from or yarn from and said, hey, I love your packaging. Where did you get it? If you don't mind sharing your source, People have been wonderful. They really, we are such a beautiful community. They come right forward and they let me know. Network, use those opportunities. If you see something you like, reach out to the person. The worst they're going to say is, no, I'm not willing to share. Otherwise, they're going to give you a great resource. And then you have more options and other ways to drive your overall costs down. And build your profits or be able to absorb costs like increased wool supply costs. So that's, that's my business talk for this week. Life. Um, so let's talk a little bit about life. 
I, I really received some wonderful, wonderful messages of encouragement and support this week from you folks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, some of you were very sensitive to how sensitive I was to other people's life trials. Some of you were extremely sensitive to my situation with my shoulder. Um, some of you shared your own stories and your own trials and thanked me for extending love last week. And some of you just plain came out and reached out and gave me love or thanked me for the idea of paying it forward. And I, I'm so... I'm so grateful, and I'm so heartwarmed, and I'm so thankful for this community, for this wonderful group of people that I have met. And it occurs to me that I do this thank you at the beginning of my show each week, but I don't get to say thank you to every one of you. And I know that when I'm watching a podcast, and I've interacted with a podcaster, and they thank me, or they say my name, I have this sense of recognition this sense of belonging, this feeling that I matter. And I want to really, really reinforce with you that if I'm not calling out your name at the beginning of my podcast, that doesn't mean that you don't matter to me. That doesn't mean that you are not recognized. I recognize every single one of you. Sometimes I don't have your name. Sometimes I only know you by, oh, the woman I interacted with about the pink yarn. Oh, that guy that asked me about blending that green and that gray together and what was going to happen and why he was getting orange. <laughs> I don't know why you got orange. I really, I played with those colors. I'm sorry. I do not know why it's coming out orange. All I can think of is that you got metals in your water and we've inter interacted about that and I'm sorry. Your username, I don't know your name. <laughs> Send me a message. <laughs> You're probably like Tom. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. But every one of you that I interact with, every one of you that subscribes to me, I have a huge appreciation for it, even if I don't know your name and I want to say thank you to you. You do matter and you are important for me in my head. And I want to reach out to all of you and suggest that you pop on over to my Ravelry group if you're on Ravelry and join the community. There's not a lot of interaction there, but I would love to see more interaction there because we're all like-minded, we're all very supportive, wonderful individuals, and wouldn't it be nice to meet other people who are like-minded? Let's see if we can't get a communal conversation going and interact a little bit and meet some new people online that are like-minded. Who knows? You may find your next best friend online. Um, and I wanted to share another thing that is part of my life that I enjoy and that has really come into sharp focus this past week where I haven't been knitting and my lunch breaks are watching podcasts, catching up on other podcasts and actually reading some of my junk email and my regular emails that I, I often have to glance over and I, I don't really get to put time and thought and consideration into. Um, I am signed up through this website, and I'll, I'll have the website name here for you, um, that provides a weekday daily email to me that is a message from the universe. And it's kind of like fortune cookies. It's, uh, it's a little esoteric, it's a little, um, it's more spiritual than it is religious, but they're reminders of the bigger picture. And you know how sometimes that fortune cookie strikes home and makes sense to you? And it impacts how you think and it changes up your day or it changes up your world or it changes up your approach? I get these messages from the universe and I love them. I love them. Sometimes they're encouraging, sometimes they're dead on, and sometimes meh. But the majority is that they, they hit home. And this past week I had one that came in that was... There's more than one way to pick an apple. Okay, 
the logical person in me starts going through, okay, you know, you, you reach and pick an apple or you use the apple picker device or maybe there's a machine that shakes the tree. And then I had a really challenging customer service phone call in my job. It was 90 minutes long. And as it wore on, as there was times where I was on hold, as there were times where I just had to breathe deeply and wait for the other person to come to an understanding, I kept reflecting back on there's more than one way to pick an apple. Because ultimately that was my goal, I, I needed this call to pick an apple. But I knew that I wasn't going to be able to just walk up and grab the apple like I wanted to. And it helped me to breathe, to stop, to consider the other person, to think my way through the problem. And those moments when I was on hold, it gave me this creative license, this cartoon in my head, where I could drive up with this very Seuss-like device that had all these arms and reached up and pick the apples all off the tree at once, or that grabbed the trunk and shook the tree <laughs> until the apples fell out, or it exaggerated the whole situation where, yes, in order to pick the apple, there has to be an apple, and sometimes to pick an apple, you have to climb the tree, sometimes you have to grow longer arms, sometimes you have to plant the seed and grow the sapling, and then grow the tree, and then bloom the flowers, and then develop the fruit before you could pick the apple. But my whole point in all this is that if you are looking for something to a jumping off point, a place to give you a new perspective, a, a reminder again that you're not alone, or a way to think more creatively, check into this site and see about signing up to get a message from the universe because that one time that the message hits home, maybe the one time that it saves you from impatience or frustration or anger or an opportunity to mess up a relationship professionally. <laughs> I know that my message from the universe this week helped me and I hope that a message from the universe will help you. Um, the one thing that I accomplished this week outside of a 90 minute phone call <laughs> Ooh. And, and a little bit of dying for you guys is I did do some beading and I finished uh, the doll that I showed you guys last week and I'm moving on to another doll already. I have really enjoyed this process. I have enjoyed digging back into it. I am going to be putting my dolls up in my Etsy shop. Um, I do do custom dolls as well. I have done that in the past and I'm always open to doing that. But I thought I would share with you the end product the, the finished doll that I did this week. And you've seen her in bits and pieces before. Here she is in her current glory. Let me see if I can block myself out so that the camera focuses for you and so that I can actually see what we're doing. I'm not doing a good job at all. Oh, how about we do that? There we go. That's her face and her arms. And then let me reposition and show you guys a little bit the rest of her body. Get in front of the camera. There we go. Anywho, this is what I did. I sat down in front of the TV and I did some beading and I was very happy to do so. And I think she came out just lovely. I do enjoy her. I don't really have a name for her yet. Um, one will come when I do the listing. But this is basically... Uh, a doll that I hand, I, I sewed the doll, and then I'm hand embroidering beads onto it. I find this to be a very meditative practice. I find it to be um, very introspective. I enjoy just listening to the art and adding to it as it develops, and I, I, I have fun doing this. Um, like I said, there won't be demonstrations of the techniques, but certainly if it is something that you're interested in, I'm more than happy to reply to your messages with resources as to uh, where you can learn more about this. That's that. That's what I have for you guys this week. As always, thank you for joining me. Thank you for hanging in there with me through this, this 
craft injury and um, I will endeavor to pull together an actual demonstration for you next week and with a little bit of luck I'll be a week further into my healing and maybe I can do a little bit of knitting. Otherwise, thank you all for your encouragement and support and know that I'm here to support you as well and have a great week. Keep breathing. Bye.